Okay, so hello everybody and welcome again. Um, this is a virtual field trip with NASA's Chandra X Observatory. I'm so happy to have you all here with us. My name is Dr. Kimberly Arkand and I am a visualization scientist with NASA's Chandra X Observatory at the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. Which is just a mouthful. I also have with me Kristen Devona, who will be speaking a little bit later as well. Um, you can say hi now. What I thought it would be great to do is just start off with a warm up poll. So we're going to launch our first poll. And that first question is Would you want to go into space? So if you were ever given the opportunity, would you want to go up in space, perhaps to the space station, perhaps to the moon? Who knows where? And go ahead and put your answers into the poll. You can either say yes, sounds awesome, or no, thank you, I'm good on Earth. And I see a few folks have put in their answers so far. And while we're waiting for that, I will just say that um, personally, I wanted to be an astronaut when I was young. I am not an astronaut. I am not an astrophysicist. I am a visualization scientist. Um, and I really did want to go into space when I was little. However, you know, it turns out that when you go on local amusement park rides and you can like barely keep down your lunch on like, the big swings or the tilt to whirl, maybe you're not the best candidate to go up into space. So ever since then, I've had my feet firmly planted on the ground. Fortunately, I really love planet Earth. I feel like there's an awful lot to see, but I'm very excited to hear that lots of you, 100% uh, of you would like indeed to travel into space someday. So we are going to end the poll and Go ahead and move on. So my own path was that I actually started out as an undergraduate at the University of Rhode Island in molecular biology. I was studying things underneath a microscope, um, looking at essentially the stomach contents of ticks and trying to understand um, how things like Lyme disease could be transmitted to humans. And yes, I have a space cat who of course wants to come and say hello. Um, so everybody can say hi to my cat midnight. Anyways, um, but I soon realized that I did not actually want to spend my whole career looking under a microscope. And I moved towards the computer science department. They were very kind and adopted me even though I wasn't in their program. And it was at that point that I realized for me, I was really enjoying being able to combine computer science and science. So using computers to help tell the story of the data that we get in science. And that combination of skills um, put me in a really good place to work for NASA's Chandrax Observatory, where I've been for about 23 years. Um, so for me, coding really was a key that sort of unlocked the universe, at least for me. And now I get to spend my time doing all sorts of different things. I started out doing a lot of coding on like applications development. Um, now I do more data visualization, virtual reality, augmented reality, um, imaging research, and so forth. So please feel free if you have any questions from your students, um, put them in the chat at any time. Chris and I will try to answer them as we can, and then we'll also save some for the end when we'll have time for open questions. So what is the Chandra X Observatory? You may have heard of the Hubble Space Telescope before, and Chandra is essentially a sister telescope to the Hubble Space, Hubble Space Telescope. It looks at a totally different kind of light than Hubble does. So it was launched back in 1999. And I just want to start by giving you a very brief message from Colonel Eileen Collins. She was the woman, the astronaut that commanded the STS-93 mission that launched Chandra all those years ago, back in 1999. And here is what she has to say to you. I'm Eileen Collins, commander of space shuttle mission STS-93. I was also the first woman to command an American space mission. On July 23rd, 1999, my crew deployed the Chandra X-ray Observatory. We had trained specifically for this flight for over 16 months. My crew felt personally responsible for the successful launch and deployment of Chandra. We trained heavily in simulators. We did standalone simulators with our training team, and we also did joint integrated simulations. Leading up to the launch, my crew was very confident that we were totally trained and ready to go. 
We weren't nervous. We were just primarily focused on doing the best job that we could. That summer, we had two launch delays. The first one on July 20th was due to a problem on the space shuttle. And then the second launch delay was two days later, and that was due to thunderstorms in the launch area. But we were happy to finally get the launch off on the third attempt, about the third time that the crew had uh, strapped in to the shuttle. People often ask me, what does it feel like to be in a space shuttle launch? It sounds like you're in a room that's on fire as you've got the boosters and the engines burning around you in what we call a controlled explosion. There's so much shaking in first stage when you're on the solid rocket boosters that if you try to write, you would not be able to read afterwards what you wrote. We had a successful launch and we were able to proceed with procedures to get Chandra on its way on flight day one. So looking back, it was a perfect deployment. Our crew watched the Chandra float away. We took our final photos and our final videos. As we watched Chandra float away, it seemed like it was almost like a sailboat on a calm sea. We knew that no one would ever see the Chandra again, but that we would still feel its presence as it continued to send its data and its information to Earth for many years to come. I just really enjoy listening to what Eileen Collins has to say. She was the first woman to ever command a NASA space shuttle mission, and she was the first woman to ever pilot a NASA space shuttle mission. So it's really exciting to um, have her on the Chandra team in some form or other. And I'm next, we're going to listen to a very short video clip from our former director, Dr. Belinda Wilkes. And let's go ahead and press play. Less than one minute away now from the 95th Space Shuttle launch. 35 seconds. T minus 30 seconds. When Chandra went up on the shuttle, so the shuttle basically lit up the sky like daylight for a couple of minutes as it went up, and the ground underneath our feet shook. Five, four, Three, we have a go for engine start, zero. We have booster ignition and liftoff of Columbia, reaching new heights for women in X-ray astronomy. We were two or three miles away. So it's just an amazing feeling of, of the power that is needed to escape the Earth's gravitational pull, which we needed to do to get in orbit. And also amazing to think that mankind can actually do this. It's very... Um, satisfying and exciting to see the results of all the years and all the people who've worked on Chandra and finally it goes up. So another really cool message. I think what's really interesting is that Chandra has to be launched into space in order to observe the X-ray universe because one of our planet's superpowers or its atmosphere's superpowers is that it actually protects us from harmful radiation like x-rays. So in order for us to be able to detect x-ray emission from the universe, we have to go above it. And so Chander goes about a third of the way to the moon at its farthest point. And so on the video that we have on our screen now is just an animation of Chandra's orbit going about a third away of, to the moon. Chandra is about the size of a school bus as well. Um, and so there's a, a really, a lot of really fascinating technological feats that had to happen to be able to create this piece of equipment, which we'll hear more about in a little bit. So what does Chandra get to look at all day? Well, Chandra gets to look at really high and hot energy universe, um, energy things in the universe. So things like exploding stars, things like black holes, things like colliding galaxies, and ever so much more from young stars to things like star clusters to merging black holes and so many different kinds of objects. So what's really useful when you're thinking about how to understand the universe is that we need all different kinds of light in order to be able to understand what's going on. So an astronomer today has like a, a tool belt and all of these different kinds of light are essentially different kinds of tools that they can use to answer different kinds of questions. And Chandra is one of many different kinds of telescopes that are either in orbit around earth or perhaps on the ground or else in orbit slightly farther away than the earth.
So it takes all different kinds of light to be able to understand what's happening. So I thought we would take a second poll at this point and figure out what kinds of light you're familiar with. And so let's go ahead and launch that poll. So we are essentially asking what kinds of electromagnetic radiation or light have you used in your life at some point? And we have for possible answers that you can choose, you can choose all of the above if you like, infrared, ultraviolet light, x-rays, or visible light. So go ahead and take a minute to answer that poll. And for the previous poll, by the way, I love that one of the classes wrote in and said a majority of students said no, they would not want to go into outer space, but four out of 19 said yes. So thank you very much. I'm glad there are other people like me um, that are not gonna have going to perhaps go out into outer space. And so we're seeing all different kinds of answers trickle in now for our poll on what kinds of light people have experienced or used here on Earth. So we pretty much have even numbers for infrared, ultraviolet, x-ray, and visible light. So we could talk a little bit about that. Thank you so much for taking the poll. So for example, if you've ever used a microwave to heat up some macaroni and cheese, perhaps you're using microwave light to be able to disturb the water molecules in your food to heat it up really quickly. If you've ever gone to the dentist or a doctor because of a broken bone or a cavity, perhaps those doctors will use x-ray light to be able to um, penetrate down through the skin and tissue into the bone or to the tooth to be able to see what's going on inside that really dense material. So you You've perhaps had x-ray light used on you. If you've ever used a remote control, for example, to talk to a television, perhaps you've used infrared light. So there are many different kinds of light that we're using in our lifetime every day. And if you've ever put sunscreen on your skin, perhaps you've protected yourself from ultraviolet radiation. So all of these different kinds of light are very useful when we're talking about astronomy. And it takes many different kinds of light, as I said, to answer those questions. You can kind of think of it as um, a piano. If anyone here plays music on a keyboard, for example, you have 88 keys. And if we only had visible light, the kind of light that our eyes can detect to be able to understand the universe, it would be like having middle C and a couple keys on either side. And that would be it. You'd have to play your favorite piece of music with about five keys. It wouldn't perhaps sound all that exciting. But if you have all of the different kinds of light in the universe, you have all of those keys on your keyboard to be able to play your favorite concerto or your favorite piece of pop music. And then that means you have a lot more information, a lot more possibilities um, to make something really beautiful. So light is really important. And we are at this point just going to take a very short trip through some of my favorite sites to see in the universe. And we're gonna be looking at images that are mostly a mixture of light. So something that contains the X-ray light from Chandra as well as perhaps optical light from the Hubble Space Telescope or radio light or infrared light. So we're going to start with this really beautiful stellar nursery where there are these tall pillars of gas and dust where baby stars are being formed. And Chandra images a whole bunch of young stars all around those tall columns that you see in the optical light. Clusters of young stars are really fascinating to be able to study in X-ray light because you get to see all of the activity that's happening. And young stars like to hang out together kind of like teenagers do, right? They like to hang out and socialize before they go off and on their way to work. So clusters of young stars are another really great thing to look at with Chandra. Also, much older stars like those found in globular clusters, which are some of the oldest stars in our galaxy, for example. Chandra also gets to look at things like mature stars that are really massive that could explode, perhaps sometimes in our lifetime, perhaps not for another 500 years, but don't worry, we are very safe from this radiation even if it does explode in our lifetime. Eta Carina is a beautiful double star system. We have other kinds of stops on that stellar evolution journey as well, such as planetary nebulas, like we'll see in the next image or two. And that is like a really special glimpse of what our sun might be like in say 4 billion years or so, as it's puffed off some of those outer layers of, of the star. 
I really love planetary nebulas, by the way, but probably my favorite kind of object in the entire universe is what I call an exploded star or a supernova remnant. These are stars that are much more massive than our sun that as they start to age, they run out of fuel and then their cores collapse and they explode their guts out all over the universe and create these stunning stellar remnants, this debris field that's left over. And it's a fascinating way to study stars. And as I mentioned, these are my favorites. So we're looking at a few of those examples. Chandra also gets to look at things like the core of our uh, Milky Way galaxy, that central region where a supermassive black hole resides, where it's sort of like the downtown region of the Milky Way, where all sorts of exciting things are happening, where there's lots of stars and pairs and neutron stars and things interacting, these really clouds of gas and dust, just a really beautiful area. Chandra also gets to look at galaxies of all shapes and sizes, galaxies that are hanging out by themselves, as well as galaxies that are interacting with others nearby, or perhaps in the process of merging with another galaxy. So we have galaxies that look like exclamation marks and cartwheels, whirlpools, galaxies with really massive jets coming out of them, clusters of galaxies where tens or hundreds, if not thousands of galaxies are enveloped in these clouds of superheated gas. And even sometimes a galaxy cluster that looks like it's smiling back at us thanks to gravitational lensing. And I think we could all use a very nice cosmic smile these days. So Chandra has done such exciting work since it launched, it's traveled billions of kilometers, it's taken thousands of trips around Earth, We've collected trillions of bytes of data and written millions of lines of code in order to operate Chandra, to collect the data, and then to analyze that data, that information that captures all of that sciencey goodness that we're going to be talking about. So now I just want to introduce you to Sabina Hurley, who is our flight operations team manager, as she talks a little bit about just how cool a piece of equipment Chandra is. They knew the science that they wanted to do, the technology to do it didn't actually exist. Countless engineers had to solve a whole host of problems to get Chandra on orbit. The mirrors on Chandra, those mirrors had to be smooth to the level of a couple of atoms. You're skipping photons, so they need to be atomically smooth. And they have to be really delicately aligned because you need all eight mirrors to be working together. Right, and they are now focusing on an instrument and the instrument chips are only four inches square. And you have to hit that four inch square every single time. And that's not actually good enough. That would just give you a blob. So to get the imaging you want, the resolution you want, you have to hit exactly the same spot on that four inch square every time. And the spot you have to hit is less than the diameter of a human hair, 10 meters away. Then you have to do this on Earth, but it's gonna operate in zero G. So you need to figure out how can I align these so that they'll be aligned on Earth for testing. But then when it's up in space, it has to stay aligned. You can't go up and fix it. So how do I build all the structure around it so that they stay aligned so precisely through all of that? So once you've done that, you have to make sure that you're controlling the temperature of those mirrors to within fractions of a degree. But you're in space. It's a harsh environment. The engineering and the level of testing and trying and retrying and testing to get just the mirrors right is absolutely mind blowing. I think Sabina has such a way with words there. And it's really interesting to hear her perspective on just how complicated it was to be able to build Chandra to catch to capture all of that x-ray information from our universe. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk just briefly about how that happens. There's an object in space that we're interested in observing. It's thousands, if not millions or billions of light years away. So we just point Chandra at that object and then essentially open it up to be able to make the observations that we're looking for. That information goes all the way down to the base of the telescope where the science instruments are located. Again, Chandra is the size of a school bus, so it's a pretty large piece of equipment. 
And that information is then packaged up into a suitcase of binary code, ones and zeros, the mechanism or the messenger, if you will, that will transmit all the way down through NASA's deep space network before it eventually makes its way to our laptops here in New England um, or my laptop specifically today in Rhode Island. So we're going to take a very short tour of our control center. NASA's um, Chandrax Observatory operates the control center out of Burlington, Massachusetts. So here we go, launching the VR tour of where we command Chandra from. So as I mentioned earlier, um, we've written millions and millions of lines of code in order to talk to Chandra because Chandra goes so far, a third of the way to the moon, we can't ever visit Chandra again. So once Chandra was launched, everything had to work perfectly. And the only way that we can talk to Chandra, that we could take Chandra to the doctor was essentially through coding. So hopefully you're all able to see my screen now. We are showing you at this point a virtual representation that was recorded at our control center. And this is what you see when you first step out of the elevators, it's kind of a lobby slash meeting space. And we can come up here and see the main conference room, which is where everybody meets when there are big meetings going on. And over here in the corner is a little space where we have some memorabilia. On the left is a banner, the Chandra X-ray Center banner that actually flew up in the Space Shuttle Columbia for the launch of Chandra. And the astronauts had it behind them as they were doing their uh, communication sessions with reporters and with other folks down on Earth. We also have a little version of Chandra. This is about 10% the actual size of Chandra. And you can see that we have a little model there. Also, there are some interesting blueprints left on the wall that you can see we used as wallpaper in order to decorate the space. And then if we come back down this corridor, you'll see that there's actually like a little sort of exhibit of sorts that showcases the history of Chandra, how Chandra was built. Chandra essentially started as an idea in the 60s and then was proposed and then funded and then built and took a couple of decades to be able to bring to fruition. So we can go down here past the lovely exhibit that Kristen designed, by the way, and come over to the main control room. And I think this is the most exciting part to see of the operations control center. This is a restricted space. And during the pandemic, of course, it was even more restricted. We really had to be super careful with everybody's health and safety while making sure we were maintaining Chandra. Chandra needs to be able to know what to do every day. So operations had to remain continuous even during the pandemic. And all of the engineers and the operators were incredibly professional about keeping things moving and grooving during that time. So you can see that there are a number of stations and consoles where we have different people with different responsibilities and different jobs. This first console is where the lead spacecraft engineer sits and they're coordinating all of the things in real time for what's happening with Chandra. Then over here, we've got the command controller center. I'm trying to get a better view. I and mean, you can see this is the person that's essentially responsible for all of those commands, all of those lines of code that are going up in order to operate Chandra and make sure everything is cool. Then over here, there are two row additional rows of seating. And this row right here, row two, is where the spacecraft subsystem engineers sit. It's they're the ones that are making sure the entire spacecraft is working well, whether it's the temperature or the location, et cetera. And you can just get a nice view of all the folks that have to sit there. And then this front row is where all of the instrument folks get to sit. So the science instrument teams, essentially, um, that are making sure all of the science-y bits and pieces on Chandra are working uh, beautifully. And then you can see the very front, there's this massive row of screens. And the screens is showing you the location of Chandra in its orbit at any time. You'll get to know the temperature of Chandra. You also get to see this wall. Let's come a little closer. This is the wall where you're talking to NASA's Deep Space Network. Those are the series of radio dishes around the world that Chandra gets to talk to every eight hours, like clockwork. And the Deep Space Network is located in Australia, 
in Spain and in California here in the US as well. And it depends on which dish is receiving the information from Chandra at which time, all pre-programmed in advance. And then you get to see other information that's essentially giving you Chandra's uh, checkup, daily checkup from the doctors, if you will. So lots of real good information to be found on this main wall. And then just for a little bit of fun in the back of the control center, we actually have some talented artists, or at least way more talented than I am at art, uh, where some people have taken the time to make little caricatures. And these are changed out every now and then uh, on this wall that just give people like a happy little thing to look at. So this says, keep it up, Chander Ops pun intended, you know, keep Chandra up in the sky. Um, so that is the idea there. So this is our beautiful control center where all of the magic happens. And then if we step back out into the hallway, um, you can see that if you keep going, there are other meeting spaces around us. There's more of our exhibit space and a quote from one of the other astronauts on the STS-93 mission, astronaut Katie Coleman. She was responsible for actually sending Chander off on its way to work. And she says that there is nothing as beautiful as Chander sailing off on its way to work. And, you know, I do happen to agree. Last but not least, before we leave our mini tour of the control center, I'll just point out back the way we came in that there are um, a couple of different interesting rooms. One houses a lot of the IT structure for the control center. And then this room down here is actually the sleeping room because during um, problems, for example, like if there's a snowstorm um, or some other really inclement weather and people can't miss their shift, because again, we really need to get that data up to Chandra and get the data back from Chandra. There are sleeping rooms so that people can crash there in case that there's something going on um, where they don't think they'll be able to make it in easily. So that is our um, mini tour of the Chandra Operations Control Center. I hope that is helpful. I thought we would at this point pop over to a quick virtual tour of the Chandra X Observatory spacecraft as well. And let's head on over. And I'm going to press start and then let my colleague April Jubet lead on this one. So here we go. So this is a little VR tour of Chandra that you can actually look at with your smartphone, for example, or if you have a VR goggles like a Google Cardboard, you could look at it with that as well. Welcome to NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory. To orbit the spacecraft and see it from all angles. Clicking will move you along to another stop on the tour. Chandra is almost 14 meters long, about the size of a school bus. It is only centimeters smaller than the largest payload the space shuttle could carry. X-rays are too energetic to bounce off traditional mirrors like we use to see our reflection. Instead, Chandra has nested, barrel-shaped mirrors that allow the X-rays to skip like a pebble across a pond and then focus on the detector 10 meters away. Chandra uses cameras and spectrometers at its target to analyze the X-rays coming from deep space. Chandra's solar panels collect power for the telescope's detectors and its radio communication with the Earth. The electricity is also used to heat the mirrors to keep them from deforming in the cold temperatures of space. In order to provide motion to the observatory, Chandra has two different sets of thrusters. Chandra aims with high precision gyroscopes. The antennas on Chandra are its link to NASA's Deep Space Network, a series of three radio dishes located at different parts of Earth. Once on Earth, the system delivers the data 
to the Chandra X-ray Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Wonderful. All right, many thanks to April for giving us that tour. And let me just get out back to PowerPoint. Okay, so I talked very briefly earlier about how we capture that information of the universe. It's recorded at the base of the telescope and then essentially packaged up in a suitcase of ones and zeros of binary codes in order to come down to Earth. So binary code essentially is a mechanism for talking to machines. We can use binary code to talk to smart TVs, to our laptops, even to smart toasters and smart blenders. Ones and zeros are really useful because it's like a system of ons and offs and electric devices use electricity, so they're either in an on state or an off state. So we can use this binary code to be able to talk to our spacecraft. Once we have that suitcase of information, it's essentially unpacked, and we use software and coding to be able to unpack that information that then shows us a table of all the stuff that happened while Chandra was looking at that object in the sky. So that stuff that's recorded, it's the time, it's the location of each little photon, each little packet of energy that struck Chandra's scientific instruments, if you will, during the observation, and all of the energy and information that is recorded along with it. We then use more software and more coding to translate that information, to unpack it a step further, and create some sort of product, some sort of plot or graph, or something that looks like an image, like what is on my screen now. Then we use more software and more coding to be able to add information back into that image. So for for example, we don't observe in color with gender because the x-rays are invisible to humans. So we colorize an image by taking the scientific information and applying it through some sort of color. So for example, on um, a weather, on your the weather report on your nightly news or on a smartphone app kind of thing, you can see a temperature map or a wind speed map or different colors mean either different temperatures or different speeds of wind. The same thing is what we're happening what's seeing here um, with the Chandra image where the information is showing you either the intensity or the different kinds of energy or temperature or what have you. And so we use more coding and software to be able to translate that information to something we can see. Now, this image that we're looking at is one of my favorite objects in the entire universe. This is a supernova remnant, of course, and this one specifically is called Cassiopeia A, and it's this beautiful, massive star, way more massive than our sun, that grew old, that then ran out of fuel, its core collapsed and exploded all over the place, and it formed this beautiful stellar debris or supernova remnant. And that first image that I showed you where it was orange was just one hour of observation time. So we didn't have a whole lot of information because it was the very first thing we ever released from Chandra back in 1999. But now about 20 years later, we have a million seconds worth of information. We actually have 2 million seconds of information, but we used about a million of those seconds in this image in order to show how you know, deep and rich this data set happens to be. And we've color coded it now by chemical element. So the iron, the silicon, the sulfur, the oxygen, for example, are all shown in different colors. So you can see where all of those different elements are um, heavily concentrated in this remnant. So we have this wonderful data of things like exploded stars, our good friend Cassiopeia A, and by using more software and more coding and more scientific analysis, we can then translate it into a 3D model. So what you're looking at here is the first ever data-driven 3D model. So using all of that information that was captured by the spacecraft and a couple of our friends as well, the Spitzer Space Telescope and some optical telescopes on the ground, to be able to create this 3D model of what that object might actually look like in space. And you can see it's this sort of spherical shell with these jets coming out. And again, the color is important because we've essentially translated the information of those chemical elements into color. So you can see that the iron, for example, is where all of that green stuff is. So the iron that was really in the core is now concentrated a little heavily around that outer region of the supernova remnant. And we can take a very quick tour in virtual reality uh, as well of this object with an application from the Smithsonian. 
And we're just going to look briefly at the different kinds of information. You can turn on each of those chemical elements that I was describing to you before, uh, looking at the Chander data, the Spitzer data, and that optical data from our telescope friends here on the ground in space. I'm just giving it a second more to load, and then we will go ahead and launch that. And what's interesting about this activity is that as teachers and students, you can go back anytime and do all of the little hands-on activities that are provided with this as well. And you can do a free explore of this application on your own using your laptop or using your phone, for example, if you wanna see it in virtual reality. So we can essentially bump up all of the different kinds of elements that we're capturing in this information. We can see the jets really strong. We can look at the silicon cloud or the argon all of those different bits and pieces that make up this stellar debris cloud. And we can really work around with it to turn it into something that is useful to us. And then if you have like a Google Cardboard, you can again uh, spin around in real time with it on your own device as well in a virtual space. So that is a very brief tour of my absolute favorite supernova remnant, Cassiopeia A. But once you have that 3D model, you can do all sorts of things with it besides virtual reality. You can bring it into a 3D print. So if you have a makerspace in your school or in your library, for example, you can 3D print your very own version of this supernova remnant and hold a little tiny version in your hand. Now this object in actuality is about 40 million billion times the surface area of our sun and planets. So it's really, really massive and we can't ever hold it in real life, but we can hold a very tiny plastic version in our hands instead. And we can bring it into other kinds of systems like VR here. One of my students is walking around so she can get a glimpse and interact with it in an interactive space. And we can even translate it into sound and hopefully you'll hear this, but this is what's called a data sonification where each of those chemical elements, those little bits and pieces of sciencey goodness have been mapped to a different sound instead of just a different color. And that means that we can hear that data and experience it in a different way. So here we go. So that is what it sounds like when we take that information that was captured and change it into sound versus just something that we can see. Because again, this information that we're capturing from Chandra, it's x-ray information that no human can ever see, right? We have to translate it into something that we can do something with. We often translate it into something that looks like an image, but we can instead translate into something that has sound or even touch so that there are different ways of understanding and experience our our universe. So on our next slide, I just have another quick message from Dr. Belinda Wilkes, our former director, to see what she has to say about how we observe the universe with Chandra. We are on this tiny little planet next to a very ordinary star that's in the middle of its life in a fairly normal spiral galaxy in some corner of the universe. And the universe is huge, and there are billions and billions of stars and billions and billions of galaxies and supermassive black holes. And yet we are sitting on this Earth, and we're able to understand at least some of what we're seeing by just looking. We so I thought at this point we would take a quick stop to think about some of the different languages that are used in order to either control Chandra or talk to Chandra or analyze the data that we get back to Chandra or model that data into some form. So as you can see from what's on my screen, there are a whole host of different kinds of languages that we use from some oldies but goodies like Fortran to more um, modern selections like Python. So everything from C and C++ to Java, Matlib, Perl, Visual Basic, C Sharp, Unity scripting, lots of scripting languages in addition. And I thought maybe at this point, it would be great to take a short poll to see if anyone here has ever tried coding before. <laughs> 
So I would love to hear from you. Um, let's put up poll number three, which is on coding. Have you ever tried coding before? Yes, indeed, or not yet. And while you're go ahead and filling in your answers, and by the way, if you have classes that are not on computers and you want to put the answers in chat, we'd love to hear from them that way. Um, my first coding language that I learned on was actually HTML. So just a very simple markup language where I learned to create a web page. And that was really exciting for me because I didn't take computer science classes in high school. We didn't even really have a computer science department back then. So instead, when I was in college, I was doing a work study to help pay for my schooling and my professor that I was working for in economics wanted a web page. So I learned HTML to make a web page. And you know, I was hooked. I was totally hooked. I thought it was so much fun. I mean, the web page I made was probably really ugly and had like tacky gifts all over the place, but I loved it because it was something that I had created by myself. And I see another um, uh, visitor is writing in that this is an eighth grade computer science class with us today. They are familiar with block and some students are learning JavaScript. That is fabulous because JavaScript was probably the second real language that I learned. I learned C++ uh, and JavaScript kind of along the same time. JavaScript to help me make better web pages. And I've used JavaScript now for two decades. It is a very, very handy scripting language. And by learning JavaScript, when some newer languages came out, such as Unity scripting for making virtual reality applications, it was very easy for me to translate my JavaScript knowledge into Unity scripting knowledge. So that jump from one kind to another was fairly easy to do. And as you can see, uh, Chandra uses all different kinds of scripting languages. And once you have one or two under your belt, it's not that hard to pick up on another one to learn even just the basics so that you can kind of talk about it. So many thanks for sharing. And it looks like 100% of people have tried coding in some form or another. So thank you again for filling out that poll. So um, let's see, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Kristen in order to give a tour of some coding and other activities that you can do with your classes if you're so inclined. So Kristen, do you want to take it away? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about some of the activities that we have that help you to explore coding and space science. Um, and just a quick note to educators, if you participate in an hour of code, um, you'll see that many of these fit really nicely into that. On our how to talk to spacecraft site, um, you'll learn to write your name in binary code and you can create beaded pins and bracelets with secret binary messages. We also have a new activity called binary beats where you can create music based on binary code. And in our next site, uh, it's called Re Recoloring the Universe. Um, and it is computer based uh, with plenty of follow along videos. Um, you can learn basic coding skills, although it sounds like you guys already have some basic coding skills, but you can progress and use actual Chandra data on um, exploded stars and star forming regions and black holes. Pretty cool. And next we have Tinkercad, which I imagine a lot of you have already used as well. Um, and we have an activity series that takes you through the basics of 3D modeling in astronomy. So you can start with really simple basic shapes. You can create an earth moon system and work your way up to using actual NASA data to create exploded stars. And then if you have access to a 3D printer, um, maybe at your school or your public, public library, um, you can actually download files uh, and print models 
of supernovas, pulsars, and even um, the Chandra spacecraft model. So each section has images and some videos about each object, so you get some background. And then you'll see an example of the model, and um, there will also be those downloadable files for you. Um, so JS9 is another um, online, oops, don't think we're going back. Can you see it okay? Yeah, I can see it now. Okay, um, it's an online data image analysis program that's used by professional astronomers, um, but we have this student-friendly um, one online that has tutorials and activities that help you to explore deep sky objects um, in depth. And someone did um, in the chat ask me if we would be posting these links and absolutely um, towards the end, I will be posting all of the links for these um, activities. And then we also have, which is pretty new, it's our Reach Across the Stars. It's a free augmented reality app um, where you explore the universe, and unlock stories of women in space science. So within the app, there are longer, uh, there are some short stories that are, you know, say one to two minutes. And then there are these longer journeys where you can ask questions of the scientists, you can listen to interviews, and then you can explore 360 degree virtual content. Um, for instance, you can get a behind the scenes look at the Mars 2020 rover, with Christina Hernandez, who is an instrument engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Being an engineer to me was a game changer. It gives me a platform to speak about things that I'm passionate about, such as science, but it also taught me how to be self-sufficient, how to think about complex problems and find simple solutions, and how to use my ability as a collaborator, as a leader, as a team player, to help us answer some of scientists' most difficult questions. So like I mentioned, I will put all those links in a chat box and I will send, Catherine, I'll send that email out to you as well. Um, awesome. Thank you, Kristen. That was really great. I love seeing all of those different activities that people can try. So we're just going to sum things up at this point. And I thought it would be great to bring Dr. Daniel Castor on board to give a quick note on what he thinks is so cool about all the different stuff that Chander has been able to do over the past 20 years, all of the incredible excitement around the discoveries and how far we've come. So here is Daniel. We didn't know that stars could emit X-rays, for example, on the way they do it. We didn't understand how stars blew up. We didn't understand black holes in nowhere close to as much detail as we do now. We don't understand the clusters of galaxies that make up the, you know, the web of space-time in the detail that we understand it now. Chandra represents a huge step forward in astronomy in general. I just adore the way he puts things. So then I'll just say thank you so much for joining us for this virtual field trip through Chandra's Control Center, uh, through the Chandra spacecraft, which took us a third of the way to the moon. And then finally, to about 10,000 light years away, where a light year is the distance that light travels in a year, or about 10 trillion kilometers. We were able to travel 10,000 light years away to Cassiopeia A and do a little quick VR tour of that as well. So essentially we've all gotten to time travel today. Thank you for time traveling with us from the safety of your own schools or homes. It's been a real pleasure to be able to tour Chandra's high energy universe with you. And if you have any questions, as we mentioned, uh, there are all of the links in the chat for the various places that we stopped at, and all of the locations are linked from chandra.si.edu slash field trip. If you want to take any of the virtual tours on your own, they're all on those pages and the activities are linked there as well. 
Uh, so many thanks to Kristen for joining me today and thank you to all of the classes. We'd be happy to stay for more questions and answers if there's time, but I totally understand. Looks like some of the classes have already had to wrap up. Um, so please let us know if you would like us to answer anything live else. You can also send us some emails and we'd be happy to respond to that as well. All right, so do we have any questions left in the chat that we didn't get to, Kristen? No, I don't think we do. Wonderful. Feel very efficient. <laughs> All right, I am going to stop the recording.